Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Angela Mackey and you're watching Ask the Mayo Mom on Mayo Clinic's Facebook Live. I'm a pediatrician at Mayo Clinic Children's Center in Rochester, Minnesota and host of this show about pediatric health topics where we take and answer your questions live. Because of COVID-19 and the safety measures we must all take to be safe, we're coming to you live again via Zoom to maintain social distancing. Today, we're discussing how to talk with your child about death and dying. Joining us for this discussion are two experts in helping children prepare for big life changes and sometimes bereavement. Our first guest is Jen Rotemeyer, a child life specialist and manager of child life at Mayo Clinic Children's Center. Our second guest is Dr. Daniel Hilliker, a clinical child psychologist. Please send in your questions about today's topic and we'll try our best to review them during the live broadcast. However, we cannot offer specific medical advice for your family circumstances. Jen and Dr. Hilliker, thanks so much for coming back again. Thanks for having us. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having us. This is such an important topic because we, none of us ever predict to be in this situation with our kids. It's so important to take the time to think about how to help kids in this difficult situation. And you both have worked um, with the bereavement teams and helping children and families um, through this process for a number of years. Is that correct? That's okay. correct. Correct. Well, let's get started by just offering some general guidelines to families that they can keep in mind when they're talking to their children about death. Yeah, I'll, I'll throw out a couple and Jen, please jump in. I, I think one of, the, one of the tricky things with this topic is um, it, it's sometimes kind of a taboo subject in families or even in cultures. Um, and so I don't think we get a lot of good modeling about how to talk about it many times. And I think also as parents, we're, we're loath to you know, do things that we, we interpret as distressing for our kids. And I think sometimes there's a, a notion that talking about it is gonna be more distressing for our kids. So I think there's a tendency, well, and I think we also feel like we're gonna screw it up at times. <laughs> and so we, we, we tend to avoid it out of some anxiety about the, the repercussions of that kind of discussion. Um, when in reality, what we've learned is that the kids really benefit from honest, age-appropriate information when they're going through tough things, really without exception. Um, so this becomes an opportunity to uh, put kids in a better position to, to cope effectively with difficult transitions. And we have we were sharing a couple kind of bullet points for families to use, take pictures of them, help them, you know, kind of guide these discussions. Um, there's a couple more here. Do you want to elaborate on some of these other ones for for parents that I think they deal more specifically with their feelings? Yeah. So I I think you know in general um, we we tend to 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 sort of try to suppress our own grief around our children and, and, and we don't want to distress them. And I think at times hiding our own grief uh, can invalidate some of what they're experiencing themselves. I think it's healthy for kids to see um, other kids who are going through similar things, who are having similar feelings like sadness and frustration and confusion and, um, and who are sharing that experience so that it's not so isolating or so that kids don't feel like there's something wrong with the experience they're having, really getting a, a chance to see how others are working through this. I think too that as a parent, it goes against your instincts. There's an excellent book titled How to Help Children Through a Parent's Serious Illness. It's written by a child life specialist, Kathleen McHugh. And one thing that she stresses in there, it, it does, it goes against our instincts as a parent because we wanna protect our child from everything, including feeling sad. But in the end, if you're not able to share that open, honest information, then there's no way for that trust to be built. And then if things keep coming up unexpectedly, your child then is able to look to you for those answers, knowing that you're going to be open and honest with them other than, oh my gosh, are they hiding this information from me because it must be really bad. And I would say one of, you know, one of the key tasks of grieving is really, helping kids come up with a narrative about what is this, why did it happen, and, and what happens next. And so if we're, if we're not 
actively helping them construct that kind of narrative, giving them information and, and modeling some of this, um, there are going to be some blanks that they're going to fill in. Um, and not always with great information. It's going to be more some, you know, it could be some of their magical thinking about it. It could be their in young children, you know, because they're so egocentric, um, they often will have thoughts about how did I play a role in this? How did I cause this? They may feel responsible for some of the things that have happened, or they may feel like it's their responsibility to somehow reverse this. So, you know, giving them enough information so that they can construct this, you know, kind of adaptive narrative about how to keep moving forward, I think is a really important task. And to remember too, that every family is going to react and respond different based on who your family is. Mm -hmm. And so today we can share these suggestions, but know that you know your family best and you as the parent and the caregiver are going to know what your child needs and, and respond to that. Okay. And responding to their, um, their needs and having these discussions probably depends a lot at where the child's developmental level is. Um, and just for the sake of like having, helping families kind of de delineate, how would you talk to a child at a developmental level that's maybe a toddler or a preschooler versus a school age or, or teenage age child? Yeah, that's a great question because it is key and important to completely understand child development before you go into these conversations. So obviously an infant and a toddler isn't able to think abstractly and they are all about the moment, what's happening now. And even an infant, they're able to sense loss or sadness around them. And so it is so important to provide the basic needs of the child. So make sure that they are on that routine that you normally do. And so whether it's feeding, sleeping, napping, and so forth, make sure that that stays consistent because that is something that you can control and then they have control and too on what's being able to happen to them next, knowing that their needs usually are met or nap time usually takes place during this time. But when it comes to preschoolers, I, I love working with this age because they have uh, such a magical thinking mind. Um, they live in this fantasy world and they are just these thinkers that think beyond um, and so when it comes to death and dying, it is so important to explain to them and use the terms that, you know, grandpa has died. Grandpa is dead. You, you, you want to avoid saying he's gone away or um, he's sleeping really hard because that child needs to be able to understand that concrete, like this is it, this has really happened. And so when a body has died, they no longer are able to breathe anymore. They no longer need to sleep anymore. They don't need food anymore. Their heart has stopped beating. Their, their body is dead. Um, this way with kids with this age too, if they take a nap and they fall asleep, they don't worry about, are they ever going to wake up? Like grandpa never woke up too. And so it's so critical to use real terminology and then explain to them at that developmental level that this is what has happened to the body. I also want to share too with parents that this is an, a stage and an age you may see some regression. So maybe you have um, worked on potty training with your child and then you regress mm -hmm. some. That it's okay for that mm -hmm. to happen. That's completely normal, especially during this time because we all will end up feeling the emotions, even the three-year-old. Um, the preschooler too may say, oh, grandpa's dead. And then the next minute, maybe talking about going to grandpa's mm -hmm. house next weekend. And so it's going to be a repeat conversation that you're going to need to have over and over with them, reminding them, you know, no, honey, we can't go to grandpa's house this weekend because he's dead. He's no longer here on earth. Um, Again, just having that conversation with them and being open with them and honest are definitely things that I would suggest for the preschool age. The other thing too, I wanna capture, cause this is again, such a big age group that mine can just 
wonder and think is sometimes they'll think that bad things happen as a result of something they personally did, whether it's their behaviors or even um, if grandpa died and I touch grandpa, does that mean I'm going to die too? And so reminding them that grandpa's body was sick. Um, it's not anything that they did wrong, that grandpa's body just stopped working and ended up dying. Um, or if grandpa had a stomach ache before he died, you don't want that preschool age child to think that next time I get a stomach ache, is that going to happen mm -hmm. to me too? And so just providing that reassurance that their body is safe. And that's why we go to the doctor. Um, so they can help us if we have stomach aches in the future. Um, school age kids, these kids are all about needing to know the facts. And so again, keeping that open, honest information with them, letting them know and be a part of some of the decisions that are being asked of them. Um, and then making sure that you offer the opportunity to keep routine for them. Just again, during these uncertain times of um, unpredictability, maybe someone's in the hospital and maybe you're frequently going to visit them. How can you still establish some kind of uh, routine for them too so they know what to predict next? But sharing factual information, using real medical terminology with them, explaining to them what's happening to grandpa's body and so forth is a way to help these kids um, in this age group. And then the adolescent, um, you know, gosh, these uh, teens have the ability to think abstractly, um, keeping in mind that um, the, the whole invincibility, you know, they're starting to understand what can happen to others, maybe not necessarily relating it or thinking that it can happen exactly to them, being um, aware of they need privacy during these times and so when they're feeling sad how are they given the opportunity for those healthy outlets and helping them identify what those may be and so maybe as a parent they don't want to talk to you I would still continue to suggest mm -hmm. being present and consistent in their life to make sure they know that if there is an opportunity that they have a question to ask of you, they feel comfortable asking you, but also happy help having, excuse me, that teen identify somebody in their life that they are able to be open and honest with. So that was Excellent. Thank you for kind of breaking that down. And, I, and Dr. Haleker, I know you kind of already went through this a little bit, but I want to see if we can go in a little bit more in depth about how you can really help support that child through a family member or a loved one's death. Yeah, so I think, well, thinking, starting off that kind of developmental perspective. So what is this child's capacity to understand death and the, the finality associated with that? Um, how is their grief likely to be manifested? So kind of helping parents understand this is what grief may look like in, in children. It doesn't look like grief that we see in adults and it's much more variable. Kids tend to grieve in fits and starts. And, and you know, I think one of the tricky things as a parent is for, for the vast majority of cases, if, if a child has lost someone significant, you have too. And so you're going through that grieving process in parallel and your process is going to be much different than your child's process and your child may kind of express this interest in talking about it or playing through it or kind of signaling you that it's time to to process grief and you kind of get yourself activated in that mode and then three minutes later they may be skipping off to play with their legos and kind of leave you in that sort of revved up state from a grief standpoint. So I think it's a, a tricky balance to, to manage your own grief and, and give yourself an opportunity to process that while also you know, sort of maintaining that awareness of your child's process, which is going to be very different and not projecting your own feelings onto your child because your child's going to be feeling much differently about it. Um, and then I think the other developmental consideration is just what sort of coping resources do they have the capacity for? You know, for young children, um, their ability to, to put language to their feelings is going to be pretty limited. So they're going to 
play through it or they're going to act it out or they're going to you know kind of seek comfort in different ways and so finding opportunities to you know read books together or just you know kind of have some extra built-in snuggle time or you know opportunities to to start helping them develop some language around it that helps them express it a little bit differently um, and then even for, for school age kids, they're going to have times where it's just these are big feelings and they're novel in most cases. And so their ability to really express it clearly or succinctly is going to be likely be limited. And that might be a frustrating thing for them. I don't know how to describe what I'm feeling. I just know that I'm really upset. Um, so finding different ways for them to express that it could sometimes it could be through, you know, scrapbooking or memorializing or, or, or doing things that really help them maintain that sense of connection with their loved one. Um, I think that's the other, the other, you know, kind of balancing act that's going on is that at the same time that you're, we know it's important to maintain a real bond and connection with the loved one after they have died. Um, but at the same time, one of the tasks of grieving is kind of reassigning some of that emotional energy that you've got tied up in that relationship that's no longer in the living. Um, so it's a tricky process. We struggle with it as adults, right? So then imagine trying to translate that into, into developmentally appropriate language and help kids facilitate that. There's a lot of, it's a lot of, uh, a lot of work. And that's why I think parents reaching out to, other parents and and other kind of loved ones who are familiar with the process just to talk through this stuff um, is, is a really beneficial thing. Don't try to do this on your own. We're not equipped. Mm-hmm. And I think it's also, we get questioned a lot too, you know, I'm feeling really sad. Is it appropriate for me as a parent to cry in front of my child? And absolutely. I mean, these emotions, just like Dr. Hillerker was saying, they're real for all of us, you know, not just the child. And so for the child to see sadness, understands that, wow, mom and dad are feeling this way too. It's okay for me to feel this way. So it offers another layer of reassurance for that child that they're not alone and not the only ones who are feeling this way. Mm-hmm. How do you maintain, oh, sorry. Sorry, you say, Dr. Say the, the, the whole notion of sad isn't bad. Mm-hmm. You know, having, having these strong feelings isn't an indication that something is wrong. It's an indication of this is a, a difficult thing that we're going through. And my, my sadness is really an indication of how much I cared about this person and how meaningful that relationship was to me. Um, that's not a bad thing. It's a difficult thing to negotiate the loss, but the feeling itself, we don't want to, you know, kind of give the message of, you know, oh, don't cry or don't be upset um, because that's just an invalidating message for kids. Mm-hmm. How do parents walk that line between projecting some of their own um, emotions onto their child versus being open and sharing um, sharing their sadness with their child and teaching them that it's okay to grieve? We're both looking at each other like, go ahead, Dr. Hilliker, you take that one. <laughs> I, 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 so from my perspective, it's really just about open communication, you know, and, and providing um, language around feelings, you know, and so if you're, if you're feeling sad, talk about what that feeling is, you know, I'm feeling, I'm feeling sad about what's happened so that it's not confused with I'm feeling upset with you, or I'm feeling upset about, you know, something you've done. Um, So I think just sharing with kids, your, you know, kind of internal process at a developmentally appropriate, you know, uh, in in developmentally appropriate language. Um, And then if you are having times where you really do feel like you just, can't control your emotions, then it's okay to, to put off that conversation and, and wait till you, you feel like you're more um, able to do so. And I think as a parent, when you're walking that fine line, if you're turning to your child for the one to have to bring you up all the time and you mm-hmm. can't get up and up, that's when you need to seek some help and, and get help from somewhere else other than your child. That's a really good point. Um, Well, let's move on to kind of really common questions that people have as they kind of go through this process of a loved one dying and then, you know, moving on to that celebration of life. 
One thing that we hear a lot is, should that child be allowed to visit the person who's dying if the opportunity presents itself? And yes, yes, yes. If that opportunity is presented, always allow the child to be a part of that decision making and making that happen. Because when I think of um, a young child coming to visit their parents for that last time, there is a uh, an opportunity for some healing for that child to get to see their parent one last time, to get to have conversations with them one last time, Um, maybe an opportunity for some more memory making together or one more memory together. And so I just always would encourage if the child is old enough to be able to make that decision to explain to them ahead of time, we're going to go see dad today at the hospital today might be the last day that we get to see him living. What are some things that you would like to do while we're there? And then give your child some options. Um, Because I think sometimes too, coming into that situation, we don't know how to react, right? But for a child, you know, they may be coming to the hospital for one of the first times, and they may be walking into the intensive care unit, and they see all of this medical equipment, and they're just not prepared. So you're going to want to prepare your child for things that they're going to see, um, you're also going to want to prepare them for things they can do. So even though dad is not awake right now and his eyes aren't open, we still don't know if he can still hear our voice. And so if you want to sing a song to him, sing a song to him. If you want to hold his hand, hold his hand. If you're not comfortable doing either of those, you're more than welcome to bring a game and you can sit in the back of the room and just be in the room with him. Making that child feel comfortable by giving them options um, just helps them be able to process and have a little bit of control in this. And then too, when they look back on this, you know, 10 years from now, and you're Maybe they can't remember that last um, visit that they had, but you're also able to remind them that they were there and this is what they got to do with dad one more time. What when about, we look, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, when, when, we, when we ask people to kind of reflect on this retrospectively, um, they're much more likely to express regret about not having had those opportunities than they are about actually engaging in those things. So I think that's an important thing to consider too. It's, it's uncomfortable for us, um, but it's very meaningful for kids to be able to participate. That actually was, was my next question is what about, you know, some of those maybe teenagers um, that really are, this is not something that they, they want to do. Um, is there, is there ever a situation where you would kind of strongly encourage them to do this or kind of push them to do this? Cause you're worried about, um, what they may feel later on, um, and having regrets. I think it's a good conversation to have with them because I think they, they may not be able to kind of think into the future about this and think about some of the implications of that. I wouldn't ever force them or kind of push them hard to do something that they were really opposed to, but I might think about what would be some alternatives. So if we don't want to do kind of a face-to-face visit, what would be some meaningful alternatives that you, that would give you a sense of participating um, in a different way? And I also too would, um, just like Dr. Hillerker was saying, they have trouble being able to see beyond. And so if you're talking with a teen, you can share with them too that, you know, 10 years down the road, you may wonder why you didn't do this. I just want to make sure that you're not going to have any regrets if you're given, you know, this opportunity to do that. So help them be able to think beyond just the moment. You know, during the time of COVID, um, a lot of children are, are not being um, given the opportunity to visit loved ones, maybe in a hospital setting due to visitor restrictions and stuff like that. What are some other ways that you can, you can do memory making um, with that loved one um, and during that time? This has been a hard, challenging time. Um, Obviously, dying at any time is difficult. But during COVID, to prevent these last opportunities for these 
memories and conversations and so forth. So things that we do is we still try to make them happen some way, shape or form. Um, you know, calling into the patient's room, doing FaceTime, we're so thankful for technology that we're still able to connect through the virtual world. But physically, um, there are some things. So like making a handprint, and even if you aren't able to be physically where um, the person is dying, you can still make a handprint from home. And then the person um, here in the hospital setting could make a handprint too. And eventually, you know, you could put those prints together. And 10 years down the road, that child can look and see, when my hand was this little, this is when my grandpa died. And it's a beautiful way to honor um, the grandpa that has died and the memory of the grandpa that has died. You know, Dr. Hillerker covered journaling is so important. Keeping a little um, memory box of memories. We have kids that will sit and write or color pictures and put them in that special keepsake box. So those are still things you can tangibly do. If there were opportunities that maybe you and grandpa on Friday nights went and had a pizza together every Friday night, continue those memories um, because that is a great opportunity even after grandpa has died to keep that memory alive. And maybe in the summertime, um, there's a spot that you have a favorite place that you and grandpa would go for a walk. Continue to go on those walks. Plant a tree in honor of him. Um, like I said, it just helps kids be able to still celebrate and have that opportunity to think of that loved one that they loved so much. But yeah, it is tricky, um, especially during times of COVID to have that connection here. Um, one more thing that I just thought of, if the child has the opportunity to write a card or draw a picture and send that to the hospital, do so, so that loved one can have that picture um, hanging up in their room. That is a, a bucket filler on both ends. Yeah, yeah absolutely. What about um, the celebration of life, the funerals and the wakes and things, especially um, if people are not listening to this during COVID times where we may have less restrictions and being able to hold in-person celebrations. Should a child be allowed to attend or participate in these, in these celebrations? I would say absolutely. Um, with, with the same kind of caveats that we wouldn't force a child to to attend, and then we would probably think about some um, flexibility in how they participate. Um, I think it's great for kids to be involved in the planning and, and kind of help think about what would be meaningful ways of celebrating this person and, and feel like they're participating in that process. Um, for younger kids, we'll often think about, you know, kind of who can be a, a a, a surrogate for them and, 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 or, or kind of care for them during the, the, the celebration so that if they need to step out at some point, um, parents aren't in the role of having to, to take care of that, or if they need, you know, just to kind of distract in some other type of activity while the, the celebration is going on, there's some options for doing that, that allow others who really want to be focused on the, the celebration and part of that shared uh, expression uh, can participate in that. And then just remember the importance of preparing your child for that event. And, you know, if they're going to be going to the funeral home and seeing the body or, you know, seeing um, ashes that are there, how are you going to prepare your child um, for that? If a child is going to go to a funeral home and be a part of maybe there's a review that's lasting a couple of hours, just like um, Daniel had said earlier too, come prepared on the fact that that child's going to want to do something um, and express in their own way. And majority of them will do it through play. And so creating just a play space in that environment. Um, I know that that probably sounds mm, backwards, doesn't it? But in the end, just allowing that child to feel comfortable in that as comfortable as possible in that environment and offering that play opportunity would be something that would help them be able to feel more comfortable when they're there. Yeah. And I think the, the other bit of preparation would be, you know, kind of talking about these are the reactions you might see from other people. 
Absolutely. You know, there may be some people who are who are quite upset and and tearful and and this is what that means. And so again, kind of reflecting on helping them construct the narrative around this entire process and um, not only their experience but others' experiences of it. And that's why it all comes back to keeping that open, honest communication throughout this entire process and doing those check-in with check-ins with your child, just so you can continue to have these conversations and prepare them for as many situations as possible, but also checking for their understanding by asking them how they're feeling um, is so important just to help you gauge and assess where they're at understanding this whole process. As, as families are going through this process, especially if there is a terminally ill diagnosis rather than maybe a sudden death, is there a, is there a right time to start talking about it and introducing these conversations um, or does, is it variable? We strongly suggest as, as soon as you can to start those conversations. Again, it goes back to just building that trust. Your child is going to realize there's not going to be any surprises that come at them. And you're going to be open and honest with them throughout. So the earlier you can start those conversations, the better. And I think it probably starts even during just an illness phase and kind of talking about the, the illness and the implications of that and what the, the medical caregivers are attempting to do to help the loved one and and that just kind of naturally can ex expand into broader conversations about death and dying if necessary. And I always add on to when you're having those conversations from the beginning that as a parent you share with your child that please know I don't know all the answers right now. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the future will look like, but know that we'll work through this together and I will be sharing information with you as soon as I, as soon as I hear it from my end too. That lets them know too that we're real and we don't have the answers to everything mm -hmm. and that we are going to be adjusting things as they come at us too. Yeah. So we're kind of nearing the end of our time here, but I want to talk about kind of outside resources. Um, what, what would be signs that um, would prompt a parent to know that maybe they need to get some additional help um, to help their child through the bereavement process? Yeah, so kind of where's the, where's the line between um, healthy and right. maladaptive grief? It's a, it's mm -hmm. a tricky one, because I think you know, the expectation is that kids are going to have more sadness, more anxiety, sometimes for, you know, a year and a half or two years after the loss. Um, and that's, you know, it, it's a hard thing to parse out. I think what we tend to look for is, is there, is there persistence in the disruption? So our kids, um, you know, rather than having these episodic, you know, uh, periods of increased sadness or anger or, or, you know, kind of uh, anxiety, are they, are they really so persistent that they're disrupting their ability to function um, in typical roles? And then kind of thinking about how, how could we get them some extra support at that time, or even just another set of eyes to, to say, does this look like the kind of bereavement that you'd expect for a child this age at this point in the process, or are there some things that we could do to really promote some different kinds of coping? Perfect. At the beginning of the discussion, you, you mentioned that it can be really helpful for children or, or other adolescents to speak with other children that are going through similar processes. Um, what are some ways we can do that? Are there groups or camps or things along those lines? Yeah, they're both. There are some bereavement camps um, and some bereavement groups. And I strongly suggest that you reach out to your local hospice who would be able to put you in contact with those resources. But those are excellent ways for other kids to meet other kids who have gone through something similar to them. Um, I've attended some of those. They're very powerful. It's interesting what the kids learn from one another that we can't even teach them. And so if there is an opportunity, I would strongly suggest that. In addition um, to the camps, if you're looking for reading resources, 
I would definitely reach out again to the local, your local hospice. I know here at Mayo, our patient education center has done a phenomenal job with having some resources available for parents on how to help their child understand death and dying, or even a parent that may be going through a serious illness, how they can help their child understand what's next. So those resources are definitely available um, through institutions. So definitely check through your hospice or reach out to your caregiver to see how you can get um, a hold of some patient education. Also some really wonderful children's books that, that address these topics. And that's such a, a nice vehicle for, for parents, I think. And kids are so accustomed to learning through stories and it's, a, it's an easy way for them to assimilate information. So I would also encourage looking into those resources. Absolutely. And one other thing I've used for the preschool age has been through PBS Kids, the Sesame Workshop has created some um, really excellent resources, toolkits for families um, dealing with grief and death um, with their children. So, yeah, I think the Sesame Street, the, the most recent one was called When Families Grieve. It's a wonderful resource. Excellent. Love it. Love it. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Well, that's all the time we have. Uh, thank you so much for joining me, Dr. Hilliker and Jen. Do you have any other final kind of um, thoughts to leave with families? For me, it always goes back to um, kids are amazingly resilient. And so resilience is the rule. It's not the exception, even in really difficult situations. So if we give them information and, and support, um, the overwhelming majority of kids are going to do really well over time. And it's all about establishing a positive coping plan, no matter what crisis hits you in life. And so you as a parent and your family have the opportunity to have conversations like this about when things come our way, here's how our family is going to respond. It just helps your kids know that you're there and you're going to be there. And here's how our family is going to work through it together. Can Excellent. I throw in one last one, Angie? Yes, please. <laughs> so what we, we've also learned is that the best predictor of kids' adjustment is parents' adjustment. So mm-hmm. the investment in supporting parents who are also grieving has a huge payout for their children and investing That's in good. yourself as a parent mm-hmm. in that role. That's yeah. good. That is really good. Well, thank you everyone who watched. Um, You can catch the next Ask the Mayo Mom live video and question answer session, which will be on Thursday, February 25th at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time. We will be joined by two pediatric surgeons, Dr. Stephanie Polites and Dr. Denise Klinkner. Um, We will be discussing chest wall deformities in children. Thank you again, Dr. Hilliker and Jen for joining us. This was fantastic. Um, Thanks for having us. You guys, I I will be asking you to come back again in the future. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. And remember to get your COVID vaccine when it's available to you.